Now here we are at the San Francisco International Book Fair. It's February 16th, 2013. And our next interview is with Michael Good. And uh, I've known Michael for about 150 years or something like that. But Michael, let's just start off uh, giving us a little biography. Where you were born, where you were brought up, uh, siblings, schools you went to, uh, companies you work for. Take us up to the point when you went into business on your own. Yes, uh, I uh, uh, grew up in Illinois, in a town called Aurora, Illinois, and later in North Park, Illinois. Went to school there. Uh, I went to college, uh, first at Elmhurst College for a semester or two, and then I uh, enrolled at North Park College and Theological Seminary. I wasn't part of the Theological Seminary, but I went to the college uh, part. Had a great education, liberal arts, wonderful teachers. And I look back at uh, uh, my education as being the th thing that made it possible to get into the book business because you got to know a little bit about everything in a liberal education. I thought that was really very important for a bookseller. And then we got married when I was still in college, had three kids. Um, after college in Chicago, we uh, went to Arizona and we lived in Arizona for a couple of years and there I met uh, a bookseller, uh, Carlton McDuffie. I don't know if anybody remembers the name, but he was pretty active and he had a bookshop in his home and that was the first person I knew, yeah. he was the first bookseller I really knew uh, well and uh, he would uh, and he had it in a shop in a little adobe place in Scottsdale. And when I was there, I was working for the YMCA. I took groups of, of kids and adults actually into the Grand Canyon and uh, up in the superstitions and so forth. Anyway, uh, the time in college uh, was just very influential to me. And I met my first collector in Chicago who was a, uh, he was, lived off campus. He, I was in, you know, 19, 20, 21. He was 27. He had been in the army. Very smart guy. And we would go over to his house or apartment uh, in Chicago on the north side. And we would uh, uh, every once in a while and drink beer and talk to him. And he had a book collection. And uh, that was the first person I ever knew who had a, a book collection. And he collected Horace Walpole books. <laughs> How leather, beautiful leather oh, volumes yeah. and so forth. Also in college, my first experience with a real bookshop, antiquarian bookshop, was Richard Barnes. Richard Barnes in yeah. Chicago. In Evanston. Great bookseller. And his wife was a bookbinder. Yeah. And I was in Old Town in Chicago one day walking around and saw this uh, <laughs> small gate yeah. and then a long path going up to this place and it said bookshop and I went in there and he was very nice to me and that's what I did. I was going to college and I looked up on the shelf or he asked something about it and I said I was reading um, at that point because I majored in history. I was reading um, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire which we had to read and he looked and said see that and he showed me a first edition. Wow. Five volumes I think it was yeah. and that just blew my mind. <laughs> somebody could own that for three hundred dollars, I could have bought it for it, and uh, so that was very influential. And the fact that his wife was a bookbinder was uh, particularly apropos, I think. And of course, that's what you know, Sandy and I uh, do now. She's a bookbinder, and I'm a bookseller. We moved to uh, Scottsdale, as I said, and met Carlton McDuffie, and then I decided at that time I wanted to be in the book business. So. I was in San Bernardino on a retreat with the YMCA one time, and I remember looking off over the mountains into L.A., and it was just a cloud of, of smog. And so if you're there, you know, there's two places to go for real books, and that would be L.A. or San Francisco, so I figured, well, San Francisco, certainly. So I took a train, the old Silver Chief, up the oh, Flagstaff, wow. and uh, went to San Francisco, uh, 
and spent about four or five days there. I visited the Holmes Book Company. I visited uh, John Howe Books. I went there three times. Finally, the third time at, at Warren's place, uh, uh, his, uh, secret uh, his treasurer, his secretary, I um, can't remember her name now, said, uh, Mr. Good, uh, really, don't come back anymore. I went three days straight. They said, don't come back anymore. Uh, we have no, there's not going to be a job here. So I, anyway, I went back when I was at Holmes. Uh, Robert Hawley uh, was there and he s and interviewed me and then he went, and then I went back, he said, we'll let you know. I went back to uh, Scottsdale and then two or three weeks later he called and said, yeah, we'll give you a job. So I put everybody in, in the, we had three kids and, and we drove up here with a few of our possessions uh, in a Volkswagen Bug and came to California, got an apartment in Oakland and started work for Holmes Book Company. I worked there for seven years from 65 to 72 and then uh, I got a job at Warren Howe, finally. Yeah, after and three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, they hired me and I was more of a general uh, um, you know, I would do all kinds of things. I, I could go out and, and look at books, pick up books. Occasionally I'd go out and buy books or, you know, at least estimate, you know, what they were worth. And I would, uh, I was never allowed to work on the floor because to work on the floor, you really have to be, you know, it's best if you're English. Yeah. And, and, it, and if you're a woman, you know, yeah. got to be nice looking and good yeah, legs. Absolutely. That was Warren's big thing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I worked there for four years, from 72 to 76 or 7. And then I decided I wanted to do art. I'd been doing a little bit of art over the years, and I was going to be an artist, because I knew a lot of, of uh, artists uh, in, uh, in Marin, where I lived, out in uh, the San Geronimo Valley. And I thought, oh, I, can, I want to do an artist. So I did art for four years, did some construction. And uh, then, then finally I said, well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at either one of them, really. I mean, I can do carpentry, you know. And actually a lot of the artist friends, you know, liked my art and would encourage me. But um, uh, I decided, well, I think, oh, I had spilled a bucket of hot, hot tar and, you know, all my skin is white up here. It took off the epidermal layer. So I said, I better get out of here and get into <laughs> something safer. So I opened a bookshop, had no money, had no books. I was never a collector. I still am not a collector. And I went, uh, uh, I went, to, when I left Howell and, and started the bookshop, I went to Warren and um, I said, uh, you know, I don't have any money. I got a little bookshop I'm renting and uh, I need some books. And he said, well, Mike, Michael, go up onto the mezzanine. This is where the, yeah. the sort of secondary books were. Right. Take what you want. And I took, I don't know, 10, 15 boxes of books. And off I went and opened my shop. I went to Robert Hawley. He gave me books. At that time, you could literally, and probably even still to these days, or now you could go to other booksellers and they'd be happy. Absolutely. To give you books sure. to start your shop. And in those days, you could start a shop. It's just an empty building on the f first floor, you know, for yeah. nothing. I remember one bookseller, I can't remember his name, in Oakland, or in, uh, yeah, in Oakland. You would know his name, but I can't remember it. He, uh, he started his bookshop. He rented a space, he had no books, put a sign, we need books. Uh, probably within a month, he had, <laughs> you know, people brought all these books into him. So I did that. Uh, started my shop with there, and my wife, who is a, was a, a nurse and also a midwife, she's delivered hundreds of babies in Marin over the years. Uh, she got tired of, of, you know, midwifery and nursing, and so there was a a, um, a, uh, uh, a course being given at San Francisco State on bookbinding. First one in the Bay Area, I think, and uh, Bob Lucas. And she took that, and so she took a two-year course there, and then she uh, practiced for two years, and then after four years, uh, she decided, well, I, maybe I can start charging. And so, 
<laughs> uh, she uh, the big step. Yeah, and so she's just been a books bookbinder busier than ever. She's never, she has never run out of work, as long as she has been in the books business. And this is what in, from eighty two or to yeah. now, never, ever, ever. You know, Thirty years. But she, she's a books. She's a you know she works every day. It's her job. Yeah. So then uh, we uh, had the shop for twenty five years. What was the lo so, tell us the location of it. It was in San Anselmo, California, over the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was on the second floor between the optometrist. The optometrist was on the first floor, I was on the second, and Sandy was on the third. And she had the better view, of course, you know, looking out the window. And, and uh, it was like, you know, if you, you get your glasses fixed, you come up, buy a book, and then take it upstairs and have it, have it, <laughs> have it fixed. Have it. <laughs> So one stop yeah. shopping, and so we uh, stayed there uh, f until nineteen or two thousand and four. Then we started having grandkids, and we really got tired of working uh, six days a week. And, I don't blame you. And you know, you get home at six at night each day, and you can't do anything. You know, you're tired, and after you have your cocktail and fix dinner, you know. So we decided to move home, and that's where we are now, out in Woodacre, California. And our house is filled with books, and we have places to entertain. We do a lot of that. And uh, the bindery is in the living room, and um, again, she's got the better view. But uh, we live on a, uh, on a, uh, a salmon creek in, um, in Marin, and uh, so we've been doing that, and we still are doing it. We don't anticipate retiring ever. Business is, it's different. It, it, the main thing, business, the book business has changed so drastically that it's hard to believe what it was yeah, like. And so quickly. Yeah. We're talking about 10, 15 years and yeah. it was changed. Well, the internet came upon us. The internet, yeah. And yeah. That, uh, that sort of was the, was the rallying cry for the new generation of booksellers. That's true. And, That's true. and they, they probably got more information out of there that they, could never have gotten if they were on their own and there was no internet. Yeah, I remember when we, when somebody asked us for a book, what did we, you know, we didn't have it. Oh, no, what are we going to do? You either had to get on the phone right. and call everybody or AB Bookman's Weekly, Weekly advertising that. But it was very difficult. It could be months before you found the book, you know, for somebody. And now it's shit. You can do it I just. Know. It put people me. like Dick Moore out of business. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. No, he was. A, he, was uh, a, he did a lot of that search service stuff, and now you don't need a search service. All you need is a computer. Yeah. And you can find everything yourself. Yeah. Well, I, my influences, you know, certainly uh, David McGee was one of them. And when I would go into Howell, I'd stop uh, as I was going up Lum uh, f from the Golden Gate Bridge up Lombard, and then David was just off Lombard on... Um, I can't and, uh, remember the street either. Uh, I had it. I had it uh, just a second ago, and I'd stop in there, and uh, David and Dorothy would be there, and smoking a cigarette. And you walked into David's shop, and there's hardly any books on the shelf. You know, a few here, a few, few there, there, some press books and so forth. But on the floor, on the carpeted floor, is where the books were. Right. And so you walk in there, and you look. Oh, there's a stack of books on the. These were what he just got in, and buy them, and they were reasonable. He was a terrific bookseller and a yeah. great bookman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he had that you know, wonderful collection of Woodhouse. Yeah. yeah. That was his main love. That was his shtick, yeah. Yeah. But also I knew him when he was next door to Warren Howe up on the second floor. And Warren was at 434 Post. Yeah. And, uh, no, I, I didn't meet David yeah. until he was on that little side street. Uh, I think I met him for the first time in 1961 mm -hmm. when we came out for the International Congress and Book Fair right. um, and that was here. Yeah. Well, Joe Rubenstein uh, moved right across the alley. Really? From him. And uh, Joe had a, a bookshop for a number of years, not a huge amount of years, no. maybe four or five years. And he was a friend of Barney Rosenthal. And uh, uh, Joe was just a sweet guy. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it was uh, 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 Gilliam and, uh, and McGee that got Rubenstein to come to San Francisco. Or no, he was over in Berkeley to move to San Francisco and move next door to uh, David, at least across the alley. And 
I don't know what I was getting at there, but there was a point. <laughs> there, there was, there's always a point. Um, let me ask you a couple of specific questions mm -hmm. rather than now that we've gotten through with you coming up to the point where you have your bookshop in Woodacre. Um, who would you say were, were your major influences, your mentors or people who you looked up to when you were young in the trade? Young in the trade, well, Bob Hawley would be the first. And uh, uh, he was uh, head of the California room at, uh, at Holmes Book and Company and sort of head of, Holmes. he wasn't the head of Holmes, Mr. Uh, Keaston was, but no. he was the president. And of course, that was, the place was founded by Harold Holmes. And uh, uh, so Robert Hawley definitely was the first and a uh, man who I had great affection for and uh, uh, liked an awful lot. Uh, and then David McGee, you know, just not that I had many dealings with him, but I would visit him. Yeah. You know? He was full of information for young dealers. Full of information. Yeah. He yeah. Was completely opposite of the yeah. East Coast booksellers in the, of that e yeah. era. Here's one question that I want to uh, get to. What do you see as the great challenges facing the antiquarian book trade uh, in the decades ahead? Uh, well, I know you come to a book fair and people are still buying all kinds of books, but um, uh, I do think uh, in the long term it's going to be the people who deal in the really old books. I think true antiquarian books are forever going to be of importance because they're objects as much uh, as yeah, anything. Right. And, uh, and then uh, the internet is going to take over so much and then with the internet it's going to be those young people who, have, who can put up a great website, know how to do and show their wares. Uh, Jeff Mazur is a good example. I, he's just a wonderful bookseller and has a great um, presence. Uh, his wife, I think, does the graphics so. and everything. Just, I'm quite impressed. And I think these are the people, the technology doing it different in new ways are the, is the future for young people. Absolutely. Because like young the, people aren't going to go in and become antiquarian booksellers. Not, not Their interest is not in that direction. And, uh, so I think that those two things, I'm glad I'm at the end rather than the beginning. I don't I, think I, I have enough brains to <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't think it's that. I, I think it's just the way the book business has changed so drastically um, it would be very difficult for people like you and I to start in now. Oh, yeah, I couldn't. Others, imagine. it would would not be an issue. Right. But well, let me ask you one one further question before mm -hmm. I let you go. Uh, if a young bookseller came up to you and said, uh, "Mr. Good, uh, I'd like to go into the book business. What's the most important thing I need?" Well, uh, I, I certainly I think again a technological know how. Um, in the past, you know, I would say, well, you know, find a storefront and yeah. start up with whatever books you can get. I think the technological aspect is important. Uh, even, even knowledge isn't as much as it, I think it... You can acquire it from Wikipedia. That's right. Enough to, uh, yeah. you know, to move make on. your point. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I mean, books aren't going to go away. I, I just don't know what, I think uh, technology is, a, is a, one of the keys. You've got to be able to get a handle on that and reach out. And of course, now the world is our, our customers. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. Anybody in the world can order a book from me. If they have a computer and they like books, they can find my book. Absolutely. And I'm only on one site. I just am on uh, uh, ABE. That's it. Yeah. Why I mean, aren't you some on the ABA? Run, well, I don't know. I guess I never knew quite how to do it, and it seemed complicated. <laughs> really, really, I'm a very simple man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all-time booksellers. We, you know, we have booksellers who have to use a computer, not computer people who sell books. And I think that's the main <laughs> distinction. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've come to the end of our session, and thank well, you thank very you, much, Michael. Michael.